Good morning, Laurel. I've got the technical difficulties worked out. Maybe it's just the Monday morning difficulties. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you, David. Very well indeed. Today, uh, Thanks for inviting me to do this. Oh, for, for sure. I, I really love this. And uh, this won't be your normal Marksware video about our software or about, you know, uh, industry things. Oh, we might touch a little bit about in Laurel's background because she has a very interesting background. But Laurel's writing a book not about graphic arts or print media or printing processes. She's writing about, well, it's a fiction book. It's called The Draftsman. And before we jump into, you know, why Laurel has written this and where you can get it and all that kind of great stuff, maybe for those who might not know, maybe you can tell us a bit more about who you are, Laurel, and what you have done yes. and what you do. I, uh, as, a, as a novelist, my name's Laurel Lindstrom, but as a journalist, my name is Laurel Brunner. And for years, I've been writing about graphic arts technology, going back to the to the mid 80s, I guess. And um, that's always been what I write about nonfiction, technical stuff to do with digital production for the graphic arts industry. And it's taken me on a very interesting journey, a very long journey. Um, and then a few years ago, I, I was looking at some stuff that I had done many, many years ago when I was still at university in California. And I found some fiction work that I had done. And I thought, but you know what, I had some of this stuff published. I think it might be a good challenge to see if I can write a novel. And uh, it's much harder <laughs> than you think it's going to be, not just because of the need for ideas, but also when you've been writing about technology and software for so many decades, it's really hard to get away from that mindset. Yeah. Yeah. So that... That was the kind of the biggest challenge, I suppose, was was crossing over from being a technical writer to being somebody who was writing fiction. Right. And uh, before we jump into the book, uh, uh, I mean, your background, you lived in California. You you worked for, I think, Seabold in the beginning. I have a very interesting background. Maybe you could tell us a bit about about that. Um, the, the reason I got I got a job with with Jonathan Siebold years ago in Malibu was because I needed work to get me through university, and um, we had a partnership that worked quite nicely. He didn't need anybody full time, but he needed somebody full time right before his uh, seminars, the three three months or so before the seminar happened, to do the kind of organising and preparing materials for and everything, liaising with the hotels, organizing the catering, all of that grunt work that has to be done to pull off a, an event. And I needed a job that would pay my, help me pay my way through university. So it worked out as a very good partnership. And we, we were both, he was obviously Seabold renowned for Seabold Publications, started by John Seabold Sr. and run out of Media Pennsylvania. And Jonathan was, was writing for that Seabold report. I did a lot of proofreading for him, um, learned an awful lot about the technology. And at the time, it was, it was when the print unions in the UK were actually absolutely holding on to, to the old hot metal technology. And it was the time of whopping. It was the time when the ATEX systems were being developed and implemented in Europe in lots of different countries. So I was fascinated by this technology. And that's what kept me going through in throughout the history of the graphic arts, the digital history, if you like, um, for the last 30 so years. And it's been fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Wow. So you were there in the, in the, in the beginning of Seabold, actually. Uh, I think I was employee number six. The, wow. the Seabold reports had been published since 1971, and I pitched up at Jonathan's office in a police car, but that's another story. Oh, uh, another video. <laughs> <laughs> in 1979. And uh, so the Seabold reports had been going out for about eight years, I suppose. And we had uh, some uh, editors and production people and sub subscribing subscriber people, administrative people in Media Pennsylvania. Um, but I was the first person on the West Coast. Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, that's more where I mean, yeah, the whole uh, Siebel yeah. seminars and... Uh, yeah, yeah, I was. And that's where Marchware, I mean, that's where Flight Check, our, our flagship product, that's where it, it, it took off. I wasn't there then. I came like uh, six or seven months later, but... From what I understand, they went there with a with a beta or an alpha version of Flight Check just to show to people at Seabold, and they spent a lot of money to get a little booth there, you know. Yes. Took a took a gamble, you know, 
Uh, thanks to you, Laurel. You know, it wasn't wasn't cheap, but uh, it was well worth it because all the, the it, yeah, it, it was a great avenue to meet the real users, and they were just you know uh, how do you call it thrilled what FlightCheck could would show them about their digital files without having to open them and dig through the file to get a pre-flight report, yeah. which everyone knows about nowadays. And but back then, it wasn't it wasn't in the applications. You know, it was a, it was a no, nobody knew that it was necessary, and it was it's, that's the thing that's made those early years of desktop publishing so absolutely fascinating. Is because we were uncovering the things that we didn't know we didn't know, and pre-flight checking was one of them, and yeah. uh, rip processing was another, and color yeah. management was another, and all of these things they go wrong, and then you identify ways of fixing them. And yeah. the Seabold seminars was the whole idea was that we wanted to create a kind of um, something com kind of not random exactly, but something where things could happen and also have a kind of intellectual oversight. And that's what the editorial team at Seaboard Publications did. So they, they were very separate from the exhibition seminar part of the business. And it, it did turn very quickly into an exhibition business. Our first um, proper exhibition was a Seaboard desktop publishing conference. It was in Santa Clara. And uh, thank you very much, Apple, because they took out the, 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 uh, the biggest sort of like massive stand. The Seaboard experience, experience is, is unique, unique in all of the high-tech high -tech industry. industry. There, there is, is and, and always has, has been, been an amazing, amazing feeling, feeling of community, of community here. here. There's, There's a strong, a strong sense, sense of purpose and direction. direction. When you when come, come to Seaboard, you get, you get the, the feeling, feeling that, that users, users are still, still driving, driving this industry. This industry. Because, because, in fact, fact you, are. you are. And I remember when I went around at the venue before the, the, this thing was all up and running, and the people from Apple, they said, well, yes, we definitely want to We want to take space here. And I thought, great, you know, what sort of size? I thought they'd say maybe, you know, 10 by 20 if we were lucky. I think it was 60 by 30. Huge wow. anchor, anchor stand for the event. And, you know, it, it just grew and grew from there because – we, we were fortunate enough that there was so much going on around in terms of technology, in terms of communications changes, later on the internet coming coming on yep. to become yet another channel for communications. And oh, yeah. We were hugely fortunate, um, but it was because there was a, it was a, an interplay between the people like Marksware showing new software ideas and then Seaboard Publications journalists who were professional graphic arts industry, knowledgeable people who had, had the whole hot metal history and the whole uh, you know, digitization of, of scanning, for example, different types of technologies that went digital. You had this, this incredible balance, balancing act going on where you had critiquing and you had the critique from the audiences and you had people brave enough to, <laughs> to take a punt, you know, yeah. see where it went. Yeah. Yeah, it was very exciting days uh, for sure. Yeah, very, very interesting. I might ask more about that at the end of this interview, but we're here for the book right now. And before we go further, <laughs> Laurel uh, is also founder, I believe, and, um, you know, of the Digital Dots, digitaldots.org. And that's a very interesting site. That's what they do nowadays, and they uh, cover a full range of. Uh, we have like a newsletter as well, I believe, right? And, uh, we have Spindrift. Uh, Spindrift, that's right, yeah. What we try to do is to explain how you can make it easier because people are still very confused by color management, for example. I think that's probably one of the biggest errors. And obviously, pre-flight pre checking and contr document control. Right. And having access, keeping everything accurate as it moves yeah. through the digital workflow. And digital workflows nowadays are so complicated. There are so oh, many yeah. things that happen to a file as it moves from somebody's head into a piece of print or into something online and everyone uses different types of tools nations yeah yeah i mean the, it, it makes sense when you think about it that the substrate is the thing that reflects the light yeah hitting, hitting the page filtered by the inks but that substrate's going to have a certain texture etc yeah to make yeah, to make it yeah, things yeah, very. Also, viewing things, you, you you know, light changes what a color looks like. So there's still there's still room to educate people in in about the application of the technology and the things to watch out for. So we with digital dots, we try and write a, a, a lot about that kind of thing. Um, we also uh, over the years, I, uh, both 
my husband and partner Paul and I uh, sit on ISO standards committees for the graphics industry. Uh, he was he represents Sweden. I represent the UK along with other people, and that is very fascinating work. So we tried very very much to write about what's going on as the ISO standards develop. So, for yeah. example, things things like the PDFX series, things like the one two six four seven for process quality control for different types of printing methods, all that sort of stuff. Has it always been your dream to write? A f well, I guess you've been writing fiction, like you said, since you were when you were younger. But yeah, I, I I had always I had always written, but I was never very good at it. You know, in the way that young people, you know, you think that just because you've written something down, it's great. What's <laughs> yeah. great is you've tried <laughs> yeah. and made an effort at it. Um, and it, <clears throat> at UCLA, I did a couple of creative writing courses, and my major is in I had in linguistics and in English literature. So, um, and I did, I, I had a couple of things published and I enjoyed it and then got caught up in work and making a living and supporting myself and, and increasingly over the years that took over and yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't something that, that, that ever really went away. So you can find somewhere on YouTube, you can find a version of, um, the Drooper song that I wrote with somebody else. <laughs> Was a music song. I think was that 2000 or? I can't remember which year it was, but if we, we wrote a Drooper song together, and and I always I've always written creatively for people's birthdays or like poems yeah. for someone's christening or whatever. Yeah, and, yeah. And then I looked through a whole bunch of old stuff that we found up in the loft, and thought, why don't I do that again? I really enjoy writing without the constraints of it being about technology. And, and also a bigger question was, can I? Can I can I make that crossover from technical writing to nonfiction? Yeah. To fiction, rather, from nonfiction yeah. to fiction. Right. And it was a big challenge, not yeah. least because a novel the, is the so mindset. long. Yeah. Yes, but it's the the mindset. Um, and my character we do have a few little passing references to the graphics industry <laughs> because the draft <laughs> Yeah, I, I have. I, that's what I know. So they always say you should write about what you know. So this character is, um, well, he, he's a, he's a, he's a very brilliant man who is a little fragile in a number of ways. And when he's sixteen, he gets all of his exams with super super good results. His family and his school expect him to go to university, and he says, "No, I won't do it. I won't because I don't want stress." I want to work in an office. I want to just go to work every day and do the same thing every day. I don't want ever to think about about biology or physics or, or maths or, or anything. I just want to have a, a, a quiet life. So he gets a job as a as a kind of like dog's body in a in a shop in an office where they um, they do drafting of documents. So they'll create architectural drawings drawings for patent applications, stuff like that. So yep. he he gets a job, he's 16, he's a, he's a bit strange, very, um, everything for him is binary, black and white, no gray at all, everything is black and white. And he he's, turns out to have quite a talent for drafting, extremely good at hand-eye coordination. And he gets asked to do a, to turn a, a rough illustration into a proper drawing for a patent application. And the, the, the drawing that he's been given is an inkjet printing head. And this is where my... <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, you can in. dive into that. Yeah, so you, if you look at early print, ink, digital print, uh, sorry, inkjet printing heads, you know, how they've evolved over time, you can see that there's certain things that change, sometimes big changes, sometimes not so big. Well, he, this young man looks at... Um, yeah, you know, the drawing and says this is wrong. It it it, it doesn't. It, it it's not right. I don't know what it's supposed to do, but there's something wrong. <laughs> Gets quite upset about it. His boss arranges a meeting with with the people who've asked him to do this work, and they explain to him what an inkjet printing head does, and he he gets it fairly quickly, and then says, well, I I I would like to make a a, a change, suggest a change for you. But he has in his head the figure of £25,000 because his father once said this to him when he was arguing, the mother and father arguing somehow £25,000 was, was, a, was a number 
that was desirable, okay? So it goes on and the conversation continues. So the man that's with him, his boss, tells him to stop and starts, takes over the conversation. Says, if, if this young man can, in fact, improve your, your uh, inkjet printing head, will you give him a contract and give him a, a, a percentage of the revenues? And they, did, they think this, these people think this whole thing is ridiculous. Oh, yeah, right, we'll do that. Okay, he says, well, I'll draft up a contract. And he does. And um, the young man comes up with a, a, a slight modification to the drawing, which it does, in fact, make it much more efficient, keeps the flow of, of fluids much smoother, much more even, much easier to control as well, so less money on the page. Um, but the contract also says if this, if this arrangement can be scaled up, or if the business is ever sold on, that this, the contract remains in place. So suddenly this young man, is, is, he's got, he's, gets a bit of income from his, his suggestion, stays working with his boss because he likes the routine, and then suddenly he, they sell the company and he's, he's earning lots of money. Doesn't really know how to deal with it. So he buys a, a, a flat in London, in a very, very posh, expensive part of town, penthouse flat, has all the walls knocked down so that he doesn't have anything interrupting his view. Everything's black and white in this flat, absolutely filthy, horrible, horrible hole that he lives in, never cleans anything, has various weird sexual encounters. His family get a bit concerned and his business manager also says, we need, to, you know, you need to spend some of this money. Well, what about this house? So he buys a house down in the country and he's binary, this guy. So he immediately decides that the house is never going to be dirty. It's always going to be pristine. Relates to people in a very odd way along the same lines. Gets to the house, finds that it's it's something he's never experienced before. He's out <laughs> in the countryside. Yeah. He's never seen in the landscape before. And he becomes interested in, in the history of his house and the people who lived there, particularly events in 1945. He becomes fascinated by the people who used to live in this house. It was requisitioned during the war, so he's interested in that. This is the first time he's been interested in anything in his life. Wow. Also, the stuff he's always done before has been for exams or because he's been told to. This yeah. is the first time he actually is interested in something. So he learns a little bit more about the history of the place and Essentially, the book is about how he heals. There are certain things that have happened to him in his, his childhood that are really rather ugly, that are repressed and squished down. Gradually, yeah. they start to come out. And he, st he starts to understand that his own frailties and his own vulnerabilities wow. and is more able to reach out to other people as the book goes on. And yeah. then there's, there's a horrible thing that happens at the end that I won't tell you about that helps yeah. him resolve. <laughs> yeah wow so i'm curious so i'm curious how it ends if it ends good or bad or you know but i guess you have to you know read the book right you know so yeah he's he's been pursuing a mystery you know to do with one of these the, the people who lived in the house before in 1945 certain things happened obviously the end of the war but right um there were certain things that happened that were never fully resolved and he thinks it's it's strange and he has the sense that this is there's more that needs to be uncovered that other than everything that people thought. So, right, right. Interesting, so, interesting. Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, you could tell us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, could, you could read the whole book to us, but that would that would uh, defeat, we don't have time for that, you know. <laughs> Oh, I'm curious about you know the Unbound site where because you're you're, you're self-publishing this book I guess you you call it right? Yes, yes. No, I'm not, it's not self-publishing oh. at all. It's um. Uh, Unbound is was set up by a couple of publishing industry, what's the word, veterans who wanted <laughs> to, to to have a publishing company that was a bit different. Their whole idea is to to encourage more diverse uh, books, fiction and nonfiction. Um, so what they have is a crowdfunding model, and they they're, they have two different categories of, of publication. They have a digital first list, which is the one I'm on, and then they have a more conventional model. In both models, the they decide whether they're going to accept something or not. And it seemed to me like it was sort of an elaborate self-publishing 
model at first, but actually it's not because I've spoken okay. to a number of people who've tried to get their books published with Un Unbound and they haven't said yes. So oh, interesting. Okay, yes. so there, it's 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 not really self-publishing. It's more like self-service publishing. They have to still be approved. You have to yeah. still be approved to work. Yeah, exactly. It's their platform. So what they do right. is if if they approve your work, they're essentially offering you a platform plus right. the support that goes al along with a normal. Uh, publishing process and what they do is they say okay well if we'll accept this we will give you a platform and you need to to sell your book in advance yeah so which they is give you a yeah the crowdfunding uh yeah the crowdfunding idea they give you a target and i think you you have a I don't know, up to a year to achieve the target. We were quite lucky with the with the draftsman. I, we hit target within three months. So awesome! Yeah, I was really pleased about that. And yeah. um, the, then the next step, once you hit the target, and you can do this. This is I didn't do this because I had already finished the whole book. But you can do this with just an idea. So if if David, you wanted to do a, 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 a non-fiction book about the history of pre-flight checking, or <laughs> or Marxware's history, or how you and, and and your colleagues came together to 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 do this business and, and run this. Well, that'd be interesting, you know. <laughs> so you, could, you could write. Well, you could write the first three chapters and then yeah. just have a synopsis. And Unbound will look at the three chapters and the synopsis and say yes or no. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. you don't have to finish the whole book. No, just but yeah, you know, probably write the uh, the chapter outline and then uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a real nifty site. I mean, I'll put links to this and I'll probably show some 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 screen uh, you know recordings of of that in between when you're talking here because it is yeah. it it was very it was very professionally done. I mean, that's part of what drew me to this was of course your name. I mean, you know, been seeing you around for years and then. Uh, the site was all in a nice combination. Yeah. Um, so the uh, the book itself, are you going to be laying it out in InDesign? How does that all work? I mean, you know. Well, I, I also, <laughs> are you using Cork Express? <laughs> or Affinity, use, Publ Affinity Publisher, maybe, you know? <laughs> no, they use, a, they use software oh. called PressSense. PressSense. Yeah, which is, you, you can buy, this is, this is, I think, this, this brings me full circle because yeah. it's a, it's a piece of software like InDesign or Express, but it's like I don't know two hundred pounds for a, for a ten book license. I don't know what Unbound's arrangement is, but an author can get get a copy of it for free and lay out their whole book. So they use that. Then they use what's the other thing called? I what the other thing's called. They have a, an HTML converter, so it takes it'll take a, the HTML turn it into PDF, it'll take the laid out page and turn it into HTML. And these are softwares that, that I had never heard of because yeah. everything we've always dealt with has been, you know, kind of high end. But right. actually nowadays you don't need to spend a lot of money on, a, on page layout and, and document design. You can Good do point. it for a fairly, fairly low price, yeah. Yeah. So, Good point. Yes, I mean, you know, it's not needed. It's really not needed. I mean, for for pure authorship, which which you're doing at this time, you don't you don't need all that uh, a full in design actually. You know. No, I don't yeah. at all. Interesting. Um, what happens is that I I had to submit my manuscript to them in a certain format that they wanted, and now I have no idea what's happening to it <laughs> because it's in the editing process. Not your problem anymore on that end, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. And like the the uh, the uh, you know the the book cover, are you going to have a book cover design done, or is that done as well? Unbound do all of that. Yeah. Oh wow. Um, I I. I don't know how long it takes. I think the the person I I've been dealing with, I guess my publisher, has said that <laughs> it's about seven months from when when they get the finished manuscript to publication. So they had the finished manuscript, um, or well, October ish, mid October, I think. So sometime so, uh, first or second quarter. May June, yeah. Somebody twenty twenty. Yeah, of next year. Somebody actually suggested that I should talk to some of the digital press manufacturers and ask them to print it on their digital devices. I don't yeah. think Amazon would really like that because that's you know, giving giving the book away. But what we might do is um, let them, I'll ask Unbound about this to see whether we could have a couple of chapters published. Right, um, for promotion. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Just, just for the fun of it. Um, 
Yeah, I'm curious how they do their their, their, their their book design covers. They probably outsource it, I gather, but you never know. You know, maybe they have internal. Uh, yeah. yeah, I do. They've they've got quite a few people working there. I've been up to the offices a couple of times, and it's it's you know it's a it's a pucker setup. They've got lots of lots of copy editors and lots of production people there. Wow. The copy editing is probably the the part that I know least about because, I mean, I, I've been writing articles for years and years and years, and I, I've I've never had anyone come back to me and say, well, maybe a couple of times, we want to make this change or that change. People will often come back to you and say, um, you, you've talked about this technology, but you haven't talked about that one. Why not? Right, you know, right. Different, uh, like yeah, different. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, very cool. It was important for me to show to show how serendipity can shape your life because my life has been all over the place. I've lived in many countries. I think I was in nine different schools before I was fifteen years old. So, wow! It, it, um, when you live all over the place, you you have your own concerns, your own baggage, but also serendipity plays a role in 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 making things get better. Yeah. Oh, it sure does. That's a great point. It sure does. Serendipity is amazing, really. Uh, nine different. What if I can? What did your father do? I mean, how, what were you? Were, you know, uh, my my father is a jazz musician. He's oh, still wow. alive. Oh, he, great. He he stopped playing about two or three years ago. I think he's he's going to be eighty seven in February. <laughs> well, I don't know what it is, but jazz musicians seem to live forever, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He well, he's a drummer, so he very high energy person and yeah. um, my mother and he divorced when I was I think eight or nine years old and we moved to Germany and that's where she met my stepfather who was serving in the um, American army and, oh. it, one, and one that's way the American another, yeah yeah ended up in New York City and then uh, came back to England back to we two went back and forth a lot and oh, wow. um, yeah Amazing, yeah, and then and then the whole graphic arts industry and that, that whole segment of your life as well. I mean, just you have an incredible life. You could write a book about yourself next time, you know. <laughs> no, I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> I shouldn't be doing that. <laughs> anyway, it, will, it will be. I will carry on writing fiction because I do enjoy it and I like the challenge of it too. Excellent, excellent. Well, Laurel's book. I'll put information where you can get it. Uh, the Draftsman. It's coming out in the, about the middle of two, 2020, maybe a bit earlier. And uh, it's very exciting that someone who's, you know, we've known in the print media business for years has, you know, sort of, yes, done her, you know, you're doing your dream and you're doing something you've always wanted to do and you've, you've you know, you've done it. So no, I'm, I'm really enjoying it, yeah. Congratulations. Um, it makes a change from writing about the environment as well because I do a weekly blog for the graphics industry about the environment on uh, the Verdigree website. And, oh, uh, wow. I'm up to number 389 blogs, wow. I think. Yeah, so yeah. that becomes much easier when I've been doing some of the fiction stuff. I don't know why. It's just because it's comfortable and it's familiar, I suppose. Yeah. Well, let me just show people here real quick the web page. Uh, I'll open okay. up. Uh, Laurel can't see this, but uh, this is the Unbound site, and there you'll get all the information on the draftsman. Laurel over here. And, um, yeah, a brilliant but damaged man. This is a story of his genius is healing and a forgotten mystery. I mean, it's a great, you know, that's what got me too. I was like, well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm going to buy it. Why not? You know? And, uh, well, I, I, was, I was hoping, I was hoping it'd be here by Christmas, but I'll have to wait, you know, so. <laughs> For the book, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No problem. But what's also nice with this, if you sign up uh, via Unbound, uh, Laurel has like, I don't know if there's like a, a frequency when it comes out, but every once in a while you get like short stories about the bees, you know. Oh, yes, the three bees, Burly, Twirly, and Curly. I yeah. Thought, I thought as, as, a, as a thank you to people um, who, who, who pre-ordered the book, I thought I should, I should give you something in return before the book comes out. So I thought we keep bees. And one of the things that is really fascinating about bees is, is first of all, their – they're amazing at what they do and they produce honey for us and they produce wax and propolis and all these great things but actually learning how a colony works and what what the bees do and how they do it and why they do it these three bees are drones and drones are the male bees and that they have only one function in life and that is to to eat and get big enough to be able to fly out and mate with the queen 
<laughs> I'm not going to tell you what happened. <laughs> except, not yet. It's it's a good life. <laughs> anyway. Life. Except, except at, at the end of the summer, if there are any drones still left in a hive, the, the worker bees, the girls, will take their wing, wings off, clip their wings off, and kick them out of the hive. Oh, yeah. Yes. Back to reality. <laughs> Back to reality, yeah. So freezing cold, no wings. What am I going to do? I think so that brings me to the next question. Are bees in the draftsman in any way, shape, or form? No. Okay. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. I expected. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah, yeah. I should Fair possibly enough. Put them in, but it would add. It would have added a complicated dimension to the the, the story because yeah. this character would not not handle bees at all. Well, he was frightened. <laughs> right. and, yeah, he wouldn't. Not his thing. No. no, because there's there's something wonderfully um, mysterious about bees and how they function, and he doesn't like mystery at all. He has to oh, have yeah. an answer to everything. He's, yeah, he's got black and white. Black and white, very, very rational. Yeah, so that was the idea with the three bees stories. And, Interesting, and I, yeah. I should do them on a more regular basis, but I didn't have time. Ah, there was a lot of time okay. Second one and the third one. It was a nice bonus, you know, unexpected bonus. And uh, yeah, I hope everyone here will check out uh, Laurel's book. And um, you know, I, uh, there's going to be a short video of this interview, and there's going to be a longer video, so you can uh, click on one or the other, where, whichever one you happen to be watching now. And uh, really, you know, I could just go on asking Laurel questions about her Seabull days. I mean, just so interesting about uh, uh, your 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 history and background. I mean, you you were right there in the beginning of digital publishing, which is just fascinating, you know. Yeah, it was fascinating. A, a wonderful years. I wouldn't change it for anything. Um, Great. But yeah. I'm glad I I'm glad I came back to England. Um, I had a lovely time living in Southern California, and all the things that we did. But I'm glad I'm home in Europe. Yeah, and, uh, I could imagine. I lived in Southern California for a while too. It's 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 mm -hmm. very crowded. Well, it's crowded in the Netherlands too. But anyway, it's <laughs> another functioning public transportation system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's right. That's right. It's a totally different uh, framework over here as compared to U.S. It's just, you know, yeah. different, you know. So uh, but anyway, Laurel, thank you very much for your time. Oh, thank you very much too, David. I really appreciate it. Really uh, wonderful. No problem. We appreciate uh, doing it. And um, have a, you know, Merry Christmas. Yes, you too. And a wonderful new year. All right. Okay. Take care. Thank you.